economics was not born an empirical discipline. Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and the rest of the early classical economists mostly made their arguments in the form of abstract reasoning. They resorted to the goings-on of the real-world economy mostly as anecdotes to illustrate the conclusions of their systematizing. Neither did the first generation of neoclassical economists seek to test their theories through observation. Leon Walra, Stanley Jevons, Carl Menger, and even the great Alfred Marshall were even more bookish than their forefathers. But it really would not be fair to lambast these theorists for failing to analyze the data. They simply could not. Modern statistics was not invented until the turn of the 20th century, and the application of statistical techniques to economics, what we now call econometrics, that was not born until the 1930s. Smith's Wealth of Nations was first published in 1776, Ricardo's Principles of Political Economy in 1817, the first neoclassicals, they published their works in the 1870s, Marshall's Principles of Economics, that came in 1890. Data analysis was not yet part of economics when those great works were first sent to the printing press. Plenty has changed since then. Nowadays, statistical techniques are a primary component of any contemporary economist's training. Econometrics comes shoulder to shoulder with microeconomics and macroeconomics as one of the most important sub-disciplines in mainstream economics. One of its founders was a Dutch gentleman named Tinbergen. He was one of the first to use statistical techniques in macroeconomic modeling. Just as Tim Bergen was inventing econometrics, he was met with opposition by none other than John Maynard Keynes. Lord Keynes, who is perhaps tied with Paul Samuelson as the most influential economist of the 20th century, he had some pretty critical remarks regarding the use of statistics in economics. He published them in a 1939 paper titled Professor Tinbergen's Method. There, Keynes argues that econometric inferences rely on six unreasonable assumptions. Those of completeness, homogeneity, stability, measurability, independence, and linearity. Let's review each of these in turn. The first assumption of econometrics that Keynes attacks is completeness. It is Keynes's view that for a predictive model to be complete, it must account for all of the relevant variables. Otherwise, it is incomplete and risks the possibility of showing spurious correlations. A classic example of spurious correlation is the associations that one finds between crime rates and ice cream consumption. By leaving out an important variable, in this case, the onset of summertime, econometric models can lead to nonsensical inferences. Keynes is doubtful whether it is ever possible to make sure that a model is ever fully complete, or to use technical jargon, correctly specified. The second assumption that Keynes attacks is homogeneity. It is assumed in econometrics that the population which data are drawn from is homogeneous enough that the data are representative of the population. However, if the population is too heterogeneous, the data collected from it may not be representative. 
statistical analysis of a non-representative sample can lead to faulty conclusions. Say, for example, we sample half of the bleachers at a sports game to find that most of the attendees sampled support the home team. We might draw the conclusion that most of the game's attendees support the home team. We would be correct if the population is homogenous. However, suppose that sports fans have sat themselves mostly alongside fans of their own team, such that most of the attendees on the other half of the bleachers support the away team. In this case, our conclusion, it would be incorrect. The population is too heterogeneous for us to draw statistical inferences from our data. Keynes is skeptical that economic data could ever be representative enough of economic systems to draw meaningful conclusions. The third assumption that Keynes attacks is that of stability. If repeated sampling of a process over time yields samples that are consistently similar, the process is said to be stable. If samples collected at different times are sufficiently dissimilar, the process it is drawn from is said to be unstable. Keynes surmised that economic systems were just not stable enough to draw consistent conclusions from using statistical analysis. In his view, the inherent chaos of economic phenomena contain just too much variation for past occurrences to predict future ones. The fourth assumption Keynes attacks is measurability. He questions whether crucial economic variables could ever be properly measured at all. Chief among these are psychological factors like the propensity to be uncertain in one's expectations, which plays a foundational role in Keynes' theory of consumer behavior to the degree that he does have one. Without the capacity to grasp these transient subjective variables, Keynes argues, econometrics is fatally limited. The fifth assumption Keynes attacks is independence. In multiple regression analysis, it is assumed that the independent variables being used to predict the dependent variable are not related to each other. In multiple regression analysis, it is assumed that the independent variables being used to predict the dependent variable are not dependent on each other. However, it is rarely the case that independent variables are actually completely independent of each other. Take, for example, a model which attempts to predict a country's national income using its amount of economic inequality and its crime rate. Any associations such a model generates will be over-exaggerated due to the reasonably well-established interdependence of crime and inequality. That is to say nothing of much more complicated mechanisms of interdependence, such as the complex relation between relative prices and income distribution, which has been posited by economist Piero Srafa. Keynes raises the concern that econometrics can never surely stamp out the effects of independent variables on each other, casting doubt over whether any of its conclusions can be taken seriously. The sixth assumption Keynes attacks is that of linearity. When constructing an econometric model, it is commonplace to presume that the dependent and independent variables are linearly associated. Keynes points out that the relationship between them may take many forms, only one of which is linear. The relationship may be exponential. It may be logarithmic. 
it might be quadratic, or it may switch between exponential, logarithmic, and quadratic at various points in time. When some variables' associations are assumed to be linear, nonlinear associations can be missed. Keynes suggests that the economic variables we really care about are rarely simple enough to be linearly related. In his view, econometrics is inclined not to look deeply enough to see beyond linearity. Nearly 100 years after the keynes timbergen debate, one would be hard-pressed to find an economist as skeptical of econometrics as Keynes was. There are at least two major reasons for this. Firstly, innovation in data collection technologies and statistical techniques have helped to assuage some of Keynes's concerns. A measure called the variance inflation factor, VIF, has been developed to help to detect the degree to which two independent variables are dependent on each other. The reset test can help alert statisticians when some non-linear relationship is present in their data. A technique called factor analysis has enabled the measurement of highly stable psychological characteristics. Among them is a personality trait called threat sensitivity, which has been shown to predict consumer behavior in the face of uncertainty. The collection of data itself has come much farther than Keynes ever imagined it would. Data publicly available from the World Bank or the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis each outsize all the economic data ever collected by Keynes's time. The use of 21st century computing power is making it possible to analyze all of that data in bulk. There is, in my view, a second, more important reason why today's economists tend not to share in Keynes's cynicism about econometrics. They have a different idea of what econometrics is actually for. When Keynes was active, the prevailing view of economic science was grounded in the philosophy of logical positivism. The logical positivists held that the role of empirics is to verify hypotheses through a process of induction. It is for this reason that the doctrine of positivism came to be synonymous with verificationism or inductivism. Positivism reigned supreme throughout the early part of the 20th century. The vast majority of academics, including both Tinbergen and Keynes, appear to have took it for granted. They assumed that empirical tests carried out by econometrics were meant to verify or prove the hypotheses of economics. What Keynes and Timbergen did not realize is that logical positivism was about to fall apart. With the publication of his major works in the middle of the 20th century, Karl Popper dispelled the notion that empirical tests can ever verify or prove a hypothesis in the way that one proves a mathematical theorem. This is because, he argues, conclusions inferred from observation are subject to Hume's problem of induction. It is always possible that inferences from observation will be invalidated by farther evidence, that is, if such inferences are to be meaningful. Popper concludes that the role of empirics is not to verify hypotheses. Instead, what empirical tests do is fail to disprove hypotheses. This insight forever changed the role observation is understood to play in the scientific endeavor. After Popper, 
academics no longer took the positivist view. They instead took the more tempered view that data supporting hypothesis does not validate it, but fail to invalidate it. Looking back at the keynes timbergen debate through the eyes of Popper highlights an error in Keynes's criticism. Keynes appears to take issue with Tinbergen because he does not believe that Tinbergen's econometrics are capable of proving economic hypotheses. In some sense, he's actually correct. Statistical analysis cannot prove economic hypotheses. As Popper has shown us, no econometrics can prove economic hypotheses. That's just not what empirical tests do. Empirical tests do not prove hypotheses, they only fail to disprove them. What Keynes was not able to see is that econometrics can indeed be useful, but not in the way that Tinbergen thought it to be. Econometrics does not derive its utility from providing absolute answers. Econometrics is useful because it can show us whether the data at hand pushes back strongly against our hypotheses or whether it leaves open the possibility that our hypothesis is correct. If you'd like to read more about Keynes's criticism of Tinbergen, please read the article by Lars Sill, which I have linked below. That's it for this short talk. If you'd like to get in contact with me, either to discuss topics in the history of economic thought or for tutoring in economics, please do so by filling out the form linked in the description of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you in the next one.